prison could find themselves in. The Apostle Paul, under arrest in a Roman prison, waiting for the potential of his execution, was writing to the church at Philippi, to the Christians there in that city, about joy. Now, this is Memorial Day weekend. I asked Kalita if she had any family members who didn't come back from a war. And she said, no, as far as she knows, they all came back. I know in my family, my grandfather was a cook in the army in Germany in World War I. Uh, he uh, was exposed to nerve gas and he had damaged eyes and was nearly blind, but he came back. My dad fought at Iwo Jima, and he came back. I had uncles who fought both in the Second World War and in the Korean conflict, and they came back. And we know the difference between Memorial Day and Veterans Day. We honor those who served as veterans on, in, in November, but Memorial Day, we remember those who didn't come back. Now, my dad was a World War II Marine. He fought at Iwo Jima. A little background, he dropped out of school when he was 16, and at 17 he lied about his age to enlist in the Marines. He was shipped to Hawaii, where he had a great time, until they shipped him to Iwo Jima. And he saw the battle. He was in the battle. His best friend, a fellow Marine, was killed in the foxhole next to him. And uh, the horrific battle was fought valiantly. They won. We know the story of the flag going up uh, and the, 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 uh, uh, the statue that has been erected in Washington, D.C. To, to honor those brave soldiers, those Marines who fought for freedom. Uh, the photo you see on the screen is the landing at Iwo Jima as the Marines disembarked under heavy fire. We appreciate that. Now, my dad got through the battle unscathed, but... Afterwards, he suffered a work-related accident on the island. He was helping to fell trees for a runway and an ironwood tree. If you know anything about trees, ironwood's the toughest wood in the world. An ironwood tree fell on him, and he was in a coma for six weeks. He was medically discharged when he came to. Um, they had shipped him back uh, in a coma to uh, San Francisco to a military hospital. And when he was well enough to be released, he didn't have any way to get back to Ohio, so he hitchhiked in uniform across the country and got a ride every time he stuck his thumb out. My dad then studied for the ministry. He preached for a while, and he finally went into the trucking industry because he had to pay the bills, and he had to keep the food on a table with himself and his wife and five kids. So... Dad spent most of his adult life then either driving trucks or making arrangements for other people to drive or being a safety inspector, actually having a little squad car that the trucking companies would provide him. But in his retirement, my dad came down with Alzheimer's. And during one visit, I experienced the most frightening trip of my life with my dad. We were driving to go see my grandmother, and in this trip, I was the passenger, and my dad, with the beginnings of Alzheimer's, was behind the wheel. I was scared to death, and so were the other drivers around us. Dad was talking and weaving and pointing and telling me things I knew about the area, but he'd go off on the shoulder, and then he'd get over really close to the, to the middle lane. And people were honking, and, and finally, finally, two-thirds of the way to my grandmother's house, he heard all this noise and a commotion. He looked in the mirrors, and he said, okay, and he concentrated on driving. When we left my grandmother's, the first thing he did was hand me the keys and said, go ahead and drive home. It was shortly after that that my dad would frequent, in his retirement, would frequent the local coffee shop and donut shop 
that's just only blocks away from the house they lived in. And he would sit there and he would love to tell the war stories and talk with others of his, of, of his own generation. Uh, he said goodbye one time late morning. He went out to his van. He got in the van. He drove it to the intersection that would take him out to the road and take him down his house. And he just simply sat at that intersection. He backed the van up, parked it again, walked back in, and he said to his friends, his buddies, can any of you tell me which way I need to go to go home? Later that day, he handed his keys to my, to my stepmother. The thing that really bothered my dad, the thing that was the hardest thing for my dad to do was to admit that a seasoned, experienced trucker could no longer stay on the road. Now, with that story, I want to ask you as Christians, what do we need to do to stay on the road? What do we need to do to stay focused, to keep our lives between the lines? Now, physical limitations are not the only thing that can derail our lives. Sometimes people strive to achieve success by the world's standards. And when they do that, it causes them to wreck. It causes them to lose control. It causes them great grief and great pain. Chuck Swindoll, Charles Swindoll, offers some advice in this area when he said, something within us all warms up to human strokes. We're motivated to do more when our efforts are noticed and rewarded. That is why they make things like impressive trophies and silver platters, and bronze plaques, and gold medals. What does it do? It drives us to do more, to gain greater recognition, to achieve more valuable rewards, better pay, or, a, or higher promotions. But how easy is it to forget that not one of those accomplishments gives a person what he or she may lack deep within? That's why they can't bring lasting satisfaction. And much more importantly, none of them earns God's favor. All the worldly things that we accomplish, all the goals that we obtain, aren't going to satisfy us. That's what the whole book of Ecclesiastes is about. That you pursue what the world gives, you wind up derailed. Here in Philippians chapter 3, Paul shares three things we must do to keep our joy. How do we keep our lives on the road? How do we keep it between the lines? How do we follow God and stay true to Him? And Paul breaks it down very easily for us in verses 1 through 11 of Philippians chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, turn to that. If you have it on your phone app, look it up. Philippians chapter 3 verses 1 through 11. We have our Bibles in our pews right in front of you as well so that you can follow along. I don't want you just to listen to me. I want you to see what God's Word says. First of all, let's understand that joy is worth safeguarding. That's what Philippians 3 verse 1 says. Paul was already talking about about joy all the way through the first and the second chapters and now in verse 3 he, in, in chapter 3 verse 1 he says further my brothers and sisters rejoice in the Lord it's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again and it is a safeguard for you he's talked about joy all the way the, through what he said to this point and now he says I'm going to tell you once something you've already heard from me rejoice in the Lord it's good to share good news and to remind ourselves of the important things that, that are in our lives. And this is what Paul was doing. Paul reminds these believers that they are to be a people who would uh, be characterized by joy. He literally is what he's saying is keep on rejoicing. Keep on rejoicing. Don't stop. Don't let anything derail you. Don't let anything cause you to make a wrong turn. Don't wind up cranking the wheel because you're gawking at something else in the world instead of looking to the Lord. Keep on rejoicing. We are to keep rejoicing because joy becomes a barrier for us. It protects us against the things that Paul has warned us of. He's warned us of dissension, which is disagreement that leads 
to discord and to separation. He's warned us of grumbling, that's complaining or protesting about something in a bad-tempered but a, but a muted way. You grumble under your breath. You don't complain out loud very often. He also has warned us about attitudes of superiority, thinking of ourselves as better than others, imagining ourselves as being the most important in the room, the king of the hill, and all the others, you fall somewhere beneath. And Paul says those things are going to want to derail us. Those things are going to want to take our eyes off of Jesus. He said, but you know, if you rejoice in the Lord, it becomes a strength for you. If you rejoice and keep rejoicing in the Lord, he said, it is a safeguard for you. So, to keep our joy, we must realize that joy in the Lord is worth safeguarding. Secondly, in verses 2 through 6, Paul says, goes on by saying, we need to be aware of those who would cause us to lose our way. Not only do we lose our way because we're distracted, not only do we lose our way because, because we uh, make a wrong turn, we lose our way in Christ because some people try to give us the wrong directions. Look at verses 2 through 6. He said, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, who put no confidence in the flesh, although I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, Paul says, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard to the law, I was a Pharisee. As for zeal, I persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, based on the law, here, get this, Paul says, I was perfect. I was faultless. He was the Jewish Jew, if you will. He was the one who said, I belong to the people of Israel. Not only that, I belong to the tribe of Benjamin. Not only that, I'm a Pharisee. Not only that, I keep the law perfectly. Wow. You talk about someone thinking of themselves as being superior? Someone who thinks of themselves of being top of the hill? This was what Paul was saying. He said that there are three things to watch out for. He said, beware of people's character if they want to tear you down. And he called these people dogs. He's not referring to our household pets. He's referring to wild scavengers that ran in packs in the, his day and age. He's, he's saying they are the ones that get their way, and they often don't care who they harm in doing it. He also said, beware of their conduct. Of their conduct. Their character is evil dogs. Their conduct is evil workers. These were the people that are often through the New Testament called Judaizers. Now, a Judaizer was, was a Christian who was born and raised Jewish, just like Paul. But he came along to the Gentiles, to the non-Christian believers, and, he, and, and the Judaizers said, We are so glad you found Jesus. You found Messiah. But... Do you know you have to be Jewish as well? And they started enforcing Jewish laws and Jewish rules on non-Jewish people. And Paul said, don't let them do that. Don't let them do that. Because what they're doing is they're adding to what God has already said. They're saying it's necessary for you to observe dietary law. It's necessary for you to worship on the Sabbath, which literally is the Saturday of the week. It's necessary for you to observe all the holy days. And most importantly, you need to have the physical mark of a Jew if you are a male. It's necessary for you to be circumcised. And Paul said no. He said they're mutilators of the flesh. Beware of their creed, of their teaching. They're mutilators. It's a, uh, this is just a term on the circumcision, the fact that, that that physical skin was removed. And it was a legal requirement that these Jewish Christians were trying to place upon new believers in Christ, upon the Gentile, non-Jewish community. And he's saying it's just an external ceremony. 
It doesn't mean anything to you in Christ. Don't let them add to what you have already received. Now, there's nothing wrong with circumcision itself, but Paul says it's wrong to teach that the Gentiles must practice what the Jewish law says in order to be saved. At one time, back in the Old Testament, the act of circumcision set God's people apart. It was something they did and they, and they were reminded of on a daily basis. I'm different than the person who doesn't follow God. Now, we have to remember that Jesus Christ is the one who allows us all to become part of God's family by believing in and obeying him as Savior, not by adding to the rules. And so Paul was not condemning the Jews. After all, here was this long list. Paul said, I was a Jew myself. I am a Jew. I cannot deny my heritage. This is who I am. But when he's warning against those who would add to the rules, who believed that somehow what they do on top of what Christ has done would win their salvation, Paul calls them mutilators. And he actually gives them this spiritual showdown, this credential showdown. They think they're important. Here's who I am. If I want to brag about my Jewishness, here's who I am. And he gives this list. And he ends by saying, I was a faultless Jew. And it looks like he might have been bragging about himself, but he's actually doing the opposite. He's showing that all our human achievements, no matter what they are, no matter how impressive they become, all our human achievements cannot earn eternal life with God. After he showed these Judaizers that he could beat them at their own game, being proud of what they were and how they had become that way, he told them, you're playing the wrong game. You are playing the wrong game. Now, as Saul of Tarsus, his name before he became the Christian, the missionary, Paul, as Saul of Tarsus, he was a hater of Christians. He agreed with the killing, the stoning to death of Stephen. And then he went on the war path, and he went looking for other Christians to bring them back to Jerusalem to see them tried, convicted, and killed. That's who this man was who was writing this, this part, of this all, of, all of Philippians chapters 1 through 4. And Saul, on his way to Damascus encountered Jesus, the resurrected Christ himself. And one glimpse to Jesus changed everything. That story is found in Acts chapter 9. One glimpse was enough to convince him forever that he had spent his entire life on the wrong road. He needed to get back to where God wanted him to be. And he was going to the wrong destination. He was going for the wrong reasons. And once he encountered Christ, it was Saul of Tarsus who believed in him as Savior and resurrected Lord and then was baptized. And afterwards, he had a name change because he had a life change. From Saul, the persecutor, to Paul, the evangelist. So let's understand how important it is to be aware of those who would want to dissuade us and change us and detour us. Most importantly, we see in verses 7 through 10 that joy, the joy that we're talking about all through the book of Philippians, comes from a real relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's finish this up here in verses 7 through 10. It says, but whatever we gain, whatever were gains to me, remember his long list of who he had been as a Jew? He said, whatever were gains to me, I now consider them loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from from God and is the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, so that somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. 
You know everything I used to be? All the things I could brag about? They're rubbish, they're garbage, they're manure, they're dung. That's the word he used when he called them garbage. Manure. Everything that people think makes them important in this life, compared to Christ, is worthless. And so I want what's worthwhile. I want to know Christ. I want to follow Christ. I want to live for Christ. I want to make sure that he is my king, my Lord, my Savior, and all of the garbage that has derailed me and detoured me and caused me to stumble, I need out of my life. And it's Jesus who removes the garbage and fills the void with his spirit. Paul uses this accounting metaphor about gains and losses. He actually goes into a business format here. He learned that nothing else we, he could do could earn his salvation. And considering how much he had been taught and how knowledgeable he was about his own heritage, he had credentials that were coming out the wazoo. And he said, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because it's Christ who saves me. It probably was difficult for him to cast all this off. It was a lifelong teaching. It was his heritage. It was his love. And he set it aside because he found something more worthwhile. He found Jesus. And so he said, basically, no amount of rule keeping, no attempts on self-improvement, no personal religious efforts can ever make me right with God. So what does Paul mean when he says, I want to know Christ? The word know here is the word knowledge. It, it, it could mean a number of things, but what Paul was saying was, I want a personal, progressive, experiential knowledge of Jesus. I want to know him as my friend. I don't want to know of him. I don't want to know about him. Certainly, I do know that. But I want to know him as my friend. I want a relationship with him. And to know Christ is more than merely knowing about him or knowing the facts or even knowing what church doctrine is. It is knowing Jesus. Paul wanted to know Christ personally. He wanted to experience Christ. He wanted to have that relationship with Christ affect his day-to-day -day living. Paul wanted to enter into the deepest possible union with Christ. He wanted to hear Jesus say, greater love has no one than this, that one would lay down his life for his friends, and you are my friends if you do what I ask. And so Paul was willing to obey, and Paul was willing to follow, not to earn the favor, but to say thank you. His baptism wasn't some show of his faith, it was obedience to Christ. And it's the way he lived. Let's not trust in ourselves or in our own accomplishments. When we do that, it will only leave us derailed and spiritually bankrupt. Instead, trust in what Jesus has already accomplished for you. Give him glory now. And he will give you his joy, which will last forever. We want you to do that. We want you to do that because Jesus wants you to do that. You know, a person doesn't have to wait until a Sunday morning invitation like this to come to Christ. It can happen any time that a person is willing to lay down what has stopped them and pick up the cross and follow Jesus. A person doesn't have to wait until a Sunday morning to be baptized. In the scriptures, we have abundant evidence of baptisms taking place at the moment of decisions. And so we practice that. But if this is your moment of decision, if this is your time to say, I need to remember Jesus, and I need to follow Jesus, and I need to keep my eyes on Jesus, and I don't need anything to derail me anymore. If this is your time, we invite you. To respond by following him, confessing him as your Lord, obeying him in baptism, and knowing that nothing can take you away from him as long as you cling to the one who saves you forever.
We invite you this morning to make that kind of commitment and that kind of decision. And you can come forward this morning as we stand and as we sing together.